and welcome to Collection Connections, a program series that seeks to connect remarkable items and personalities from a variety of library and museum collections. My name is Lisa Pulsifer, and I'm the Head of Education and Public Programs at the Harry Ransom Center. This month, we're exploring the voices of Dylan Thomas in a transatlantic conversation that highlights archives from Swansea University in Wales and the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Our speakers are Professor Daniel Williams and Professor Kurt Heinzelman, both of whom I wanna thank for their time and insight today. The occasion for this program aligns with the new online resource made possible by an international collaboration between the Ransom Center, Swansea University and the Dylan Thomas Trust. You can now explore more than 6,000 images of manuscripts of Dylan Thomas's poetry, radio broadcasts, plays, film scripts, photographs, correspondence, and more in the Dylan Thomas Digital Collection. Please see our website for more information on that. If you're joining us live today, we invite you to ask questions in the comment box throughout the program. We'll get to as many as we can toward the end of the discussion. Now, on to our program. Hello, thank you, Lisa. It's um, uh, I'm delighted to be here today with my dear friend and colleague, Daniel Williams. I will be talking eventually about Dylan Thomas's voicing of his poems, but I'm going to start by speaking about craft, a word we use more often these days in writing workshops than in literary classes. Why is a vexed issue I won't go into. When Dylan Thomas refers in his poetry to his craft, it's a reminder that he cared deeply about his own craftsmanship. Also useful to remember is that the word craft in its earliest usage meant power in the sense of physical prowess, the idea of craft as skill coming later. I mention this today because one of Thomas's best known poems in my craft or sullen art hinges on this equivocation over the power, or let's call it the persuasiveness of artistic craft. But first, a little context. During the Second World War, Thomas scripted propaganda films as a salaried employee of Strand Films, and then wrote documentaries for the BBC. In short, he worked for wages. He also wrote what he called spindrift pages. Spindrift is a driving spray off wind-blown waves. These poems were largely elegies, expressing unspeakable outrage at civilian deaths. By these different ways, he tried during this difficult time to exercise his art in a public idiom. As the war drew to a close, the need for that public voice didn't diminish so much as changed. While the world sought to craft politically a sustainable peace, and while as a poet, he sought to sustain his art against that ever-present existential fear of being silenced by global or personal failings. In My Craft or Sullen Art alludes to wartime issues, but it's mainly about the situation of poetry. Perhaps it even anticipates Theodor Adorno's earth-shaking assertion that no poetry can be possible after Auschwitz. Readers agree what Thomas's poem means, what its semantic intent is. It says that the poet writes not for fame or riches or even sustenance, but for lovers, the only ones similarly dissociated from these material gains. What's not clear, however, is the poet's attitude, that is, his feelings about the poem's intentions, his tone of voice. Tonality, of course, can significantly change the semantic meaning of what is said. In this poem, the tonal key may be that little word in the title that is repeated in the first line, sullen. The neutral meaning of sullen is solitary, but the emotional associations are manifold from morose, ill-humored, sulky and gloomy, to sluggish, obstinate, intractable, and even dismal, baleful, and malignant. How sullen is the poet himself about the consequences 
of his solitary art. Thomas concludes, after all, that the lovers, his only intended audience, do not need or even want his art. That sounds a little morose or gloomy, a pretty powerless recognition of how little craft can accomplish. There is, however, always another kind of craft when a poem is voiced, when it is heard. In the reading by Thomas I'm about to play, the poet seems to be pitching the poem for public approval, giving the poem a wider public dimension than perhaps the language of the poem permits. As you will hear, the poem explicitly denies it wants the public approbation sought by those towering dead poets from the great romantics to the great moderns like T.S. Eliot with their nightingales and psalms. And yet, in Thomas's operatic and plangent performance, beginning with his jokey introduction, the poem seems tonally to deny this denial. Have a listen. I'd like to finish with a little sentimental poem. Incidentally, which isn't true. I mean, it, it's true that it, it, it's, it's sentimental, but don't you believe everything you hear? Exercised in the... This poem is called In My Craft or Sullen Art. And it says that I write in the night. <laughs> I write in the afternoon, like anyone else. <laughs> this poem is called In My Craft or Sullen Art. In my craft or sullen art, exercise night, when only the moon rages, and the lovers lie abed with all their grief, 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 singing light, not for ambition or bread, or the strut and trade of charm, charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms run round griefs of the ages who pay no praise, nor heed my craft or art. There's a little more vibrato in that recording than, uh, than even Thomas could manage uh, in real life. When Thomas says in the last sentence that the lovers do not heed his craft or art, the little adjective sullen gets silently erased. Why is that? Is it because the lovers do not hear the poem as the poet does? They do not hear what the poem says as either guidance for them or a warning to them. That is, they do not heed it. But what should we heed when we listen to a poem? So have another listen, this time to Thomas speaking the same poem in a radically altered tone. This reading is half as long. Its tone is solemn, but not sullen in any extravagant way. It only sounds solitary. There is no audience. The reading is hardly performative at all, but more an articulation of a quandary. The quandary being not how to pay for art, whether via praise or wages, but rather who benefits from any exercise of artistic craft. Thomas's intonation here is almost that of private prayer, as if the poem's principal listener 
is not the lovers at all, but the poet himself. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages, and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread, or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man of heart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. So <clears throat> let us heed what is happening here. Remember how Thomas introduced that first reading by telling his audience, don't believe everything you hear. This admonition means that he heeding is a function of what we hear. Performance can determine, even overwhelm what we hear. But all lyric poetry also understands solitude as a prerequisite for entertaining a problem, and also preserves a private voicing in which applause is not the fundamental issue. So do we need to choose between Thomas's two readings? Inevitably, we will, I suppose, but here's the dilemma, all lyric poetry always exists in both dimensions at once, as both public, perform, public performative utterance and as private introspective inquiry. That is every poem's essential equivocation, which is finally up to us as readers, as listeners to negotiate. I'd now like to turn the program over to my colleague and friend, Daniel Williams. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kurt. I was just uh, having trouble putting my camera on there for a minute. Um, it's great to be here with you all. Um, I think it's uh, suitably uh, Lyndon Johnson who said about uh, Gerald Ford that he couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, I'm going to try and run my PowerPoint presentation and uh, give my presentation at the same time. So bear with me just while I get the uh, PowerPoint presentation up. I hope everyone can see that. So, well, I, I believed everything you said then, uh, Kurt, and uh, it was a, a well, wonderful introduction to Dylan's voice uh, in performance. Um, today's title, Through Throats Where Many Rivers Meet, comes from Dylan's poem, In the White Giant's Thigh, and is a suggestive phrase, I think, because Dylan's own throat gave voice to a body of work where many rivers meet. Uh, and of course, this session is literally a meeting of voices in uh, transatlantic dialogue, as, as Lisa said in her introduction. My discussions and dialogues with Kurt uh, over a period of almost 10 years now are always uh, an inspiration and delight. Um, and let me also thank the team at the Harry Ransom Center for facilitating this event. Uh, the Ransom Center has a great collection of materials relating to uh, what we call Welsh writing in English, that is the Anglophone writers of Wales. Um, not only the, the largest collection of Dylan Thomas papers, but uh, also the papers of Lynette Roberts. Uh, there are papers relating to people like uh, Fris Davis, Geraint Goodwin, 
um, and moving right to the present, actually in Sinclair's papers, for instance. So I'm looking forward to coming back uh, once we're through with the uh, pandemic. Uh, the image on, on the first slide there is one I took at the Ransom Center. Uh, I'm quite fond of that array of, of heads because Dullen rises himself uh, above the others. He, he, he's uh, between T.S. Eliot and uh, D.H. Lawrence there. Our collection at Swansea University uh, is located in the Richard Burton archives, named after the actor whose papers were deposited uh, at Swansea University by his widow, Sally. And Burton was, of course, himself a great admirer of uh, his fellow Welshman, uh, Dullen, and his own readings of the poetry uh, and the uh, recording and film of Under Milk Wood would be the subject um, of, of, a, of another session. The jewel in our collection uh, is the fifth notebook. Um, it's actually not known how many notebooks Dullen left behind him. He sold four when he discovered that he could make some money out of them uh, to the State University of New York at Buffalo in the 1940s. Uh, the fifth was saved by uh, a maid of the McNamara family, Caitlin McNamara being Dylan Thomas's wife. And um, it came up fortuitously really for auction in Thomas's centenary of 2014 uh, and was bought by Swansea University. Uh, it's been edited as you see here by my uh, former colleague, John Goodby and uh, um, a postdoctorate student, Aid Osborne, who's with us at Swansea uh, and was published uh, last year. For those of you familiar with, with Dylan Thomas's writings, uh, I'm sure you're aware of him in a sense as a poet celebrated for the universalism of his themes. Uh, In My Craft or Sullen Art captures that, uh, the poet writing for the common wages of the hearts of lovers, their arms around the griefs of the ages. But I'm going to head in the opposite direction uh, in my few words uh, now. Heading into the archive, if you like, delving backwards to try and identify some of those particular rivers that met in Dullin's throat. Returning and revisiting is precisely what a collection, an archive allows us to do. Uh, the fifth notebook contains versions of some of the key poems. Uh, my world is pyramid. I dreamed my genesis, a grief ago, also wise by our light amongst others. With lines added and deleted, uh, commas removed, spellings corrected, and so forth. One of the major influences on Thomas, as he testified himself, uh, was the Old Testament. And the prologue to his collected poems evokes the story of Noah and the Ark. The Ark, in that case, preserves the animal species of the world. And the archive, in a sense, preserves the writer's prior works, prior selves. The Ark of the Covenant comes to mind as well, containing the Ten Commandments, and is also a, a presence in Thomas's poetry. A grief ago, in particular, uh, is a story of, well, is informed by the story of Exodus, explicitly references the Red Sea, and the cherubs that God tells Moses to carve around the Ark of the of the covenant. Now the density of Thomas's imagery means that there's a great deal of interpretive enjoyment to be had in untying or identifying the many rivers meeting within particular lines. Consider the following lines from A Grief Ago. The leaden bud shot through the leaf was who was folded on the rod the Aaron rose cast to plague, the horn and ball of water on the frog housed in the side. You'll pick up some of the references to, to Exodus and the plagues just in those lines. John Goodby usefully unpacks a mere five words, the rod the Aaron rose, which he notes combine backwards as well as forwards to generate the biblical Aaron's rod, the rose of Sharon, and Arianthrod. Now, Aaron's rod belongs to the poem's Exodus narrative. The rose of Sharon 
describes a bride in the Song of Solomon and would later become a description of Christ. The fusion of Aaron and Rod into Ariandrod is more of a push, but then that relates directly to the frog housed in the side. Ariandrod refers to the mother of the original Dullin in the medieval Welsh myths of a Mabinogi. Math, son of Mathonoi, seeks reassurance that Ariandrod is a virgin by asking her to step over a magic rod. And as she does so, a large, sturdy, yellow-haired boy drops from her, who jumps frog-like into the sea and is called Dullan Aildon, Dullan, son of the wave. So the Welsh language and its literary tradition are hidden beneath the surface of these lines. Um, this is a kind of compacted place of difference comprising the Jewish Torah, the female body in labor, and Welsh language culture. And this kind of hidden presence, perhaps we might call it a repression of the Welsh language, is a significant element in Thomas's writings and is intimately related, I think, to the female voice and the silencing of the female voice, the voice maybe of his Welsh speaking mother, and related as well to the Old Testament imagery, uh, whose stories he would have heard by her side. Uh, in, the, in the chapels that he'd attend with her. So a grief ago enacts a twin rhetorical move. It embraces and explores particularistic origins, the particularity of the Jewish and Welsh traditions, while expressing an universal sense of loss. In the poetry of Dylan Thomas, to embrace the universal, that aspect of his poetry that's most widely celebrated perhaps, is also to grieve for the loss of the particular. Now I'll let you go and explore the poem, but I think a grief for go takes place in a graveyard, a location of several Thomas poems and the location of a photograph of him, actually a striking photograph that I can't show for copyright reasons by uh, the photographer Roly McKenna, um, the Houston born photographer, perhaps the most substantial uh, Dylan Thomas, Texas link other than the Ransom collection. Any visitor to Wales will notice the graveyards around nonconformist chapels. And uh, Thomas's most extended engagement uh, with that nonconformist Welsh language culture and tradition of his forebears uh, is the poem after the funeral in memory of Anne Jones. The Anne Jones being memorialized in that poem is the Annie of the short story, The Peaches in whose loving arms the young boy runs upon arrival at Fernhill Farm. Annie's farm is also the lilting house of the poem Fernhill that some of you might be familiar with, the place in West Wales where uncles and aunts spoke with the Welsh lilt and where Thomas first came to appreciate the sound of words, I quote, on the lips of the remote and incomprehensible grown-ups who seemed for some reason to be living in my world. Now these incomprehensible grown-ups are significant. Um, I tend to think it's not just that the boy is not yet able to understand them. They're actually speaking another language. Um, one of the things I did during this uh, COVID period actually last summer was to go on a pilgrimage to visit some of the areas of uh, rural Carmarthenshire where Dylan would visit his aunts and uncles, including Capel Smyrna in Llangain, um, where his auntie Anne would attend chapel and where Dylan attended Sunday school when he visited. Sunday school conducted incidentally in Welsh um, and visited the grave of Anne Jones herself, uh, which is on the slide. Er Cof Anoil Amani Jones, Mount Pleasant, Llangain, James Jones, As you see, the grave is in Welsh. Now the poem after the funeral begins with a sense of incomprehension, as the mourners bray like mules within a fragmented scene dominated by body parts observed 
in a surreal sequence of sail-shaped ears, a peg leg, black teeth, and spittled eyes. Before the morning smack of the spade that wakes up sleep, shakes a desolate boy who slits his throat in the dark coffin and sheds dry leaves. So this now is not a throat where many rivers meet. It's a slit throat. The opening is one of fragmentary observations and memories representing a dreamscape maybe in anticipation of the funeral that is to come or the poet's attempt at piecing together a sequence of memories that piecing is difficult and fragmentary because of the poet's own linguistic alienation from the Welsh spoken by the community being described. The sound of Welsh is like the sound of animals for a boy whose slit throat symbolizes a termination of cultural transmission. The dry leaves relate imagistically to the parched world of Wales that appears later in the poem. As John Ackerman first noted, parch can also be read as parch, short for parchedig, the Welsh word for minister, an example of the intralinguistic punning that occurs elsewhere in Thomas's poetry, and which here suggests that this is a religious and linguistic tradition that has run dry. It's on its last peg leg. I'll let you explore the poem after today's session, but I can recommend my colleague Emwyn Thomas's book, um, In the Shadow of the Pulpit, Literature and Nonconformist Wales, which uh, contains a, a very fine reading of the poem. So speaking from Wales uh, this afternoon, I'm arguing that probing beneath the surface of Dullin's poetry, delving into the archive, is also to some extent a probing into another culture, the Welsh language culture, that profoundly informed his work, even if it was a culture that he was denied by his parents, both of them being Welsh speakers. Speaking in general terms, perhaps particularly to an American audience, we might describe Dylan Thomas's work as the product of a process of ethnic assimilation, a term more, familiar, more familiarly applied to um, American ethnic groups than to minorities within the British state. But I think this does have something to do with the resonances of his voice and his appeal to 1950s America. In New York in particular, Dylan became a figure of some significance for a generation of Jewish Americans, many of whom were themselves one generation removed from Yiddish, and would become to be identified as the New York intellectuals gathered around journals like the Partisan Review, Dissent and Encounter. And it was one of this generation, Alfred Kazin, who in 1957 wrote the most perceptive analysis on Dylan's influence on America in an article on the posthumous life of Dylan Thomas published in the Atlantic Monthly. In his notebooks from the same period, Kazin noted that in America, I quote, the poor boy from Swansea now found himself living at a pace which is not only unthinkable in quiet down at heels, moldy Wales and almost as quiet London, but found that he, the romantic rhetorician and auto-stimulant par excellence was in the land of romanticism, of possibility, the land where every love affair promises happiness and a poet, if he's famous enough, stands out from the crowd enough to be admired by everyone. America itself worked on him like whiskey, as New York did on Hart Crane. Kazin had personal reasons for writing, for one of those love affairs was with his sister Pearl, herself assistant liter literary editor of Harper's Bazaar, copy editor at the New Yorker, and a regular fiction critic for the new leader commentary and partisan review. The letters of uh, Pearl Kazin to Dylan have been edited by Jeff Towns in this book, A Pearl of Great Price. In a diary entry, the day after Dylan Thomas's death, this is my final slide, um, Alfred Kazin asked, how much light goes out with the passing of our wizard, our beautiful careless singer? 
With everything you can say against the automatism, even the lovely self-infatuation of this man, he embodied the deepest cry of poetry. He was our young singer. What lovely pride, I say. What unforgettable bounty of the world. It is this bounty, this true, rich singing fluency, the manner entire, the big stance, the world flowing, flowing, for which I remember him with so much love this gray morning. Dullen the speaker and Huck the speaker. The speaker is a magician, he casts a spell. As I write, I sometimes hear myself saying the words over to myself. Between the echo of some great voice I hear in my head and the look of the words on the page, I am always a speaker selecting words. But sometimes the voice, having found itself, gathers strength and swells beyond what it knows. We are then bewitched prisoners of our own spell. And if we go on, can sing praises only to this spell itself. This is what Dylan often did, I think. The voice, once heard, becomes our refuge from the eternal abyss of the silence. Dylan as Huck Finn, a remarkable contrast, I think. Remarkable, not just because it transforms Dylan into a fictional hero, but also because for Ernest Hemingway, famously, but also for Alfred Kaysen in his seminal account of the American novel on native grounds. Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is the work that establishes an American tradition in the novel. And Mark Twain does so by creating a vernacular voice, drawing partly on African-American resources that releases American writings from prior Anglophone models and allows them a cultural space in which to develop their own voices, their own national identity. And here Dylan is a huck for the 1950s, his voice, a life raft, a refuge, it seems. As we've both done some work on Dylan's American reception, I'll, I'll end there with this image of the, of the boathouse on the slide um, and uh, open things up to, to Kurt. Let me uh, pass the baton back to you now, Kurt, and uh, well, ask you maybe to comment or respond to what we've been saying so far. I, I love the, um, the, the final quote there by Kazan, um, where he talks about himself listening to the voice that he hears, uh, which is sort of what I was trying to uh, get at in discussing in my craft or sullen art and the various voicings that Dylan Thomas uh, uses. You know, um, Huck goes down the river with the uh, slave Jim and um, as I was thinking about the title for our presentation today, um, I'm immediately struck by the, the allusion, it appears, an allusion to the most famous of Langston Hughes's poems, The Negro Speaks of the Rivers, uh, where the, the river is in his throat as he, as he meditates on the history of um, the, uh, the African diaspora. Um, was Langston Hughes, how, <laughs> folks, you don't know that uh, Daniel Williams has written probably the definitive book on the connection between um, African-American writing and Welsh writing. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if, um, if Dylan Thomas had Langston Hughes in mind. Um, there is, a, there is a dull and Langston Hughes connection, uh, Kurt, or, or, or a, a lack of connection, in fact, because uh, Penn, um, the, the, writer, the writer's um, a community, were putting on an event in New York um, for Dylan during one of his visits, and uh, Langston Hughes was going to be compare, um, and Dylan never turned up. <laughs> so this is one of those moments in literary history where, where um, things don't quite meet up. Um, another interesting African-American connection is the, the night that Dylan Thomas died, uh, Pearl Kazin, who I refer to, was at a party with John Berryman and um, Ralph Ellison. Um, and Ralph Ellison drives Pearl and um, John Berryman to St. Vincent's Hospital in New York um, and writes in, in a letter to, um, to Berryman's uh, biographer that he, he didn't feel uh, sufficiently involved to actually get out of the car, um, but but they you know they visited 
uh, Thomas's bed, and indeed Berryman was was at Thomas's bedside when when he died. So the so the story goes. But of the three, Ellison had the strongest connection in the sense that he'd been in Swansea as a GI during the Second World War, and actually in the 1980 introduction to Invisible Man says that the gestation of the novel, uh, uh, you know, that he, he began thinking of the novel while in in uh, in Swansea. So. Um, Wow. Some interesting connections there. That is that is lovely. Well, <laughs> there are certainly um, some unexplored, I think, uh, connections between uh, Thomas and American writers. Thomas never met Hart Crane, the writer that Kazan refers to uh, in that in that passage you, you put on the screen, because Crane had died by the time um, Thomas got to the States. But there's an interesting story around the word spindrift, which I alluded to in the uh, poem in My Craft or Sullen Art. If you look up the word spindrift in the OED, it says that the first usage of that word in a figurative sense was by Dylan Thomas in 1946 in that very poem. But in fact, no, the first use of the word spindrift in a figurative context occurred in a poem of Hart Crane's published in 1926 called Voyages. And the line is, um, he talks about the seal's wide spindrift gaze toward paradise. To me, that's a pretty figurative use of the word spindrift. And it actually occurs in a poem in which Crane talks about how the terror of the sea rends apart all but the pieties of lover's hands, which is a line that is so close to the line about the lover's arms around the griefs of the ages uh, in, uh, in my craft of solid art that it's, it's extraordinary to me. Um, yeah, it's so not extraordinary see. that the OED misses this. They don't miss much, but sometimes they do. But, well, it's um, another substantial transatlantic connection, isn't it? And uh, yeah, yeah, Dullin was a kind of sponge, wasn't he? I mean, his poetry seems to distill all kinds of influences, um, which is kind of what I was trying to uh, emphasize. I'm aware we could carry on speaking for forever together, Kurt, as, as, we, as we have in the past, but maybe we should bring Lisa in here to see if there are questions from the floor, so to speak. Thank you both. We do have one question so far from Ian Ragsdale on YouTube. Um, did Thomas himself address the influence of the Welsh language on his writing? And if so, what did he say? Well, he said different things to, to different people. Um, on the whole, he denied any knowledge. Um, there's a review, I think it's Stephen Spender writes a review and talks of uh, the influence of uh, Welsh language poetry, you know, he's just assuming. And, and Thomas responds by saying, um, I can't read Welsh. Although reading, of course, is different to having some knowledge of it. And it's quite interesting that American, um, uh, Americans encountering Thomas will, will often report on his knowledge of Welsh. So John Malcolm Brynion talks about Thomas sitting up in bed in the morning, singing Welsh language hymns. Um, Brynion also returns with, with Thomas at one point to um, the area that I was talking about in Carmarthenshire and uh, describes Thomas speaking to a farmer over the hedge and Brynion confessing that he doesn't understand a word that they're saying. Now, whether that's a strong Welsh accent he's hearing or whether Thomas did actually have enough fragmentary Welsh to be able to um, conduct a conversation. Um, those who are familiar with bilingual settings will know it's really a matter of knowing or not knowing a language. You know, there, there, there's a kind of range. And Dylan Thomas was on that range. You know, he, he certainly knew folk songs, knew hymns. There are plenty of people who testify to that. So I think his, his instinct was to deny that knowledge. But my suggestion is actually it's very much there as a presence. And it's likely that he knew more than we might, we might think. But, but there, there's no doubt, is there, Daniel, that in terms of the fame game, he'd hitched his horse to the Anglo poetic cart um, and, you know, very much thought of himself as a poet who would, who would be accepted in the, in the great English line. 
English language line. Yes, absolutely. Um, as you might imagine, in the, in the situation where you have a minority language under threat and a dominant language that's emerging as, 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 as the new language of the nation, if you like, so the relationship between the two literary traditions in Wales have been um, tense at times, it would be fair to say. And within the tradition of Anglophone writing in Wales, there's a fair amount of dismissal of the Welsh language as a, as a rural, um, uh, outworn, moribund language and so forth. Um, you get that in Caradog Evans, who was a Welsh speaker himself. You get it later in Gwyn Thomas, the working class author of the Fronda. But you tend not to get that in Dullin. You know, he, he tends not to be dismissive in quite that, in quite that way. Um, he seems to have some respect in some ways. Um, and even that voice, you know, someone, um, someone hearing Dylan Thomas for the first time often responds, you know, that's not a Welsh accent. Well, he had elocution lessons and actually described himself as speaking as though I've got the Elgin marbles stuffed down my throat, which again, references to throats, but also it's an interesting kind of colonial image, that one, as if in, in fact, you know, th there's, there's an element of playing the role of having to live up to a certain Anglophone ideal and being aware of, of that process. But this whole issue though also goes back to his very name, uh, the name in his throat, because in Welsh, um, Dylan is pronounced Dylan, Dylan. And there's a story, whether it's apocryphal or not, we don't know that at some point, uh, Dylan, young Dylan went to his father and said, my name is Dylan, it is not Dylan. And so he made a clear distinction that, that his name was going to be uh, Anglo. Yeah, so speaking of African-American uh, uh, resources, he, he does um, mention at one point, my name's Dullen, as in all, uh, uh, Eugene O'Neill's title, all, all got chillin'. What's the- Chillin', uh, chillin', yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that, that rhyme. Yep. We but yes, never... his, his mother was almost certainly have called him Dullen. Um, as in Dalan in the Welsh form. Great, thank you. We have another question from YouTube. This is from Francis, and they ask, one of the most fascinating aspects of Thomas's poetry to me is its incantatory vocal quality when read out loud. Is there any sort of documented influence of bardic tradition for Thomas's writing? Um, yeah, well, there is, um, although again, he tended to deny it, but um, there have been plenty of attempts, some more successful than others, to trace um, the bardic patterning that we call Kanghanev, which is where particular consonants echo across the lines um, uh, and across lines within a poet. The poetry almost becomes vertical and horizontal at the same time, you know, it, it literally chimes um, and a line like I sang in my chains like the sea that ends Fern Hill is, is a perfect line of, of Kanghanev in, in fact. Um, the Welsh poet T. James Jones has an article in, in a, a centenary celebration of Thomas edited by Hannah Ellis where he documents um, the lines and there are so many of them and the, and the laws are so intricate that it's very hard actually to believe that they're completely accidental. Um, although there's no, there's no real evidence of, of Thomas having studied Kanghanev, although the, the, there's, there's sort of oral evidence. Um, and Irene Talvan Davis's wife, for instance, claimed that when he was driving Thomas around, um, Thomas was always asking him about um, the bardic tradition and the metrical structures of Welsh verse. Uh, and and Dylan's own father was knowledgeable about that tradition as well. So again, you know, um, the lines, a lot of this is repressed, I think, and there's always the danger of being accused that you're trying to make Dylan Welsher than he is, you know, that there's some kind of essentialist attempt to, to, to make him a, a, a kind of Welsher poet than he ever claimed to be. But I think the evidence is there that he was genuinely interested in all that and did deploy um, Welsh bardic structures in his, in his poetry. Great, so we'll end with one more question. Um, and it's about Thomas's place in literary history. Is he considered more of a neo-romantic, a modernist, a proto-postmodernist? Do the collections that you guys have been able to examine at these archives shed any light on this question? Kurt, do you want to take that one? Um, 
I hate labels like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, look, um, the, um, there was an article, article published a few, um, a few years ago in Poetry Magazine uh, by a young poet who strongly dissed Thomas for his heavy breathing, for his self-absorption, for his heavy-handed rhetoric, um, and um, went on to, generally speaking, to say that uh, Thomas would not, would not be an influence in modern American poetry at all. Uh, although he did add, I don't really hate the poetry that much. But the, uh, the foundation that publishes Poetry Magazine, Poetry Foundation, um, lists one of Dylan Thomas's poems as the poem that gets by an exponentially large number more hits from readers and listeners than any other poem in their archive. And yes, it is that good night, that good night poem. So I think the, the answer that I would like to give to that question is uh, Dylan Thomas's poems will live as long as English is spoken. Um, the, um, the discovery of this kind of packed um, elusiveness that Daniel was talking about in the poem A Grief Ago and in others. <clears throat> that's kind of a, that's a late discovery, I think, you know, among critics that there is, by late I mean after, after Dylan Thomas's death, um, that um, these aren't the poems that people are reciting. These aren't the rage, rage against the dying of the light poems, but um, they, they have, that we're discovering a real depth in them that I don't think readers back in when he was alive understood, maybe not even in Wales. Daniel, I may be wrong about that, but what do you think? Yeah, I think I tend to uh, agree, Kurt, although you do get a sense that people are often responding. There's, there's almost a, um, a signifying level in the poetry that's beyond just what can be explicated by, by critics and that people were picking up on that. Um, I was just thinking about that generation of, of New York intellectuals for whom Dylan was clearly very significant. Um, he was very significant then for the emergence of the beat poets and when people like Kerouac or Ginsburg or Shapiro refer to Thomas, they're often referring to him as a poet who's doing more than they can do and more than they can even express. So the, 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 the challenge of Thomas's poetry, in, in a sense, is, is to try and unpack it for the, for the critic. Um, but for a popular audience, uh, of course, it, it's, it's just there. And, and it's an oral experience, uh, which, of course, because of the Cademan recordings, we, we can actually still hear him read it. And, and it was nice to hear those two versions, Kurt, because we often hear, think of Thomas delivering Do Not Go Gentle in that booming, uh, possibly ministerial voice. But the, the recordings have all kinds of different kinds of voices, some of them humorous, some of them quiet. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a parody of T.S. Eliot uh, in, yeah. in one of the poems. Um, and there's also when he's recalling his childhood, um, his Welsh accent comes through very strongly as well when he's reading um, A Child's Christmas in Wales and some of those stories. So he is a poet of voices, quite, quite, quite literally, on the page uh, and, on, and on record. And yeah, the way he refers to living in a country of whales. Yeah, that, in like, fact, that, that pun appeared on the slides before the show as well. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And if you enjoyed today's program, please subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook channels. I want to thank our speakers, Kurt Heiselman and Daniel Williams, for a great conversation today. And a special thank you to David and Ellen Berman for their generous support of this program series.